the, the verse of scripture that through it all, through it all, I've learned to depend upon God's word. Maybe you saw me leafing through some pages. I was leafing through God's word, mostly. And uh, here, here's a scripture we can, through it all, the Lord will protect that which concerneth me. Anybody have things that concern you? Thy mercy, O Lord, endureth forever. Forsake not the works of thine own hands. Amen. That's the word of God to depend on. Amen. 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 Right. The title of this morning's message is Open Hearts, Acts 16. 9 through 15. During the night, Paul had a vision. There stood a man of Macedonia, pleading with him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. When he had seen the vision, we immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We therefore set sail from Troas, and took a straight course to Samo Thrace. The following day to the Apples. And from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city for some days. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river, where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. A certain woman named Lydia, a worshiper of God, was listening to us. She was from the city of Thyatira and a dealer in purple cloth. The Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly to what was said by Paul. When she and her household were baptized, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay at my home. And she prevailed upon us. She prevailed upon us. Amen. Lord, be with us in a special way in this very special time as your word is shared. May it change our lives. To your name we pray. Amen. I think this morning, God does wonderful things when our hearts are open. I think this morning, God opens our hearts. Amen. May it be so. Like in God's word. Amen. You know, when I first came to this passage, I thought, what's the big deal about the passage? This passage, and there were several, and I already shared one with the kids' message. First, right off the bat, men seeking and following directions. Wow. Tuning in and listening to God. And right before this passage, the region of Phrygia, and we went, we went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word of God in Asia. That was 16.6. They attempted to go into Bithynia. But the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. And so passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, 1680. Then Paul has the vision, a guy from Macedonia pleading with them, come over to Macedonia and help us. He said, she, you know, she really, how did Paul know he was from Macedonia? Well, God made a plan somehow. And when he had seen the vision, we, it's not just an I here. There's a we. He 
something powerful is going to happen, there needs to be a we, not just an I. We immediately tried to cross over to Macedonia, being convinced that God called us, and they set sail to go there. I remember sitting in New Testament class at the Eastern Baptist Theological Seminary, and the professor, Manfred Brown, said, talked about a Macedonian call, meaning a direct, compelling call to do something specific in your life, or in the life of the church that came to St. Paul. A New Testament professor who came after Manfred Brock, his name is Greg Keenan, wonderful man. You know, in his commentary one time, in this biblical commentary, Greg Keener gave an opportunity for people to accept Christ as their Lord and Savior. If you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you can do it by doing it this way. Just ask Him into your heart. Ask Him to, to, to change your life. And, 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 he didn't even say that. He said, ask Him to be your Savior. We're in the middle of a biblical commentary. I've never seen that before. Greg Keener says this. The Macedonian call tells us God loves all peoples. If we love Him, we will also love and serve all peoples. Isn't that? It's in the Bible. Roman numeral number, point number one. We set sail from Troas and took a straight course to Samothrace. In your study Bible, look up all those locations. I hope I'm giving you, well, where is that? I hope I'm giving you a desire to, to do more study in God's Word. Following day to Neapolis and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in the city for some days. Philippi was a place where just a lot of Roman soldiers retired and hung out there. I already gave it away. There's a powerful we here. The we here, the we, includes St. Paul, Timothy, young Timothy, great figures in 16, Silas. You remember that Paul and that other guy's name, Barnabas, they split. And God gets two for the price of one. They split because Paul wanted to take John Mark and to give him a second chance. And Paul said, no, he went back to mommy the first time, he'll go back to mommy again. Who was right? Thank God Barnabas gave John Mark a second chance. He wrote a gospel, the gospel according to Mark. We all have a hard edge sometimes, don't we? Paul had a hard edge with John Mark, but then later he says, hey, send that guy John Mark to me. Send him. He's a lot of help in my ministry. Thank God for second, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth, and seventh chances. Amen? But the we, Paul, Timothy, Silas, and Luke. Luke now is not just writing this. He's a part of the story. He's a doctor. He's a physician. Now he's hanging out with them. There's a powerful way. When God is in something, there's a powerful way. Point two. They seek a place of prayer. On the 16th, 13th, on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate by the river where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had gathered there. 1630. What's going on? To have a Jewish synagogue where Paul would have gone, there was no synagogue in Philippi. Why? It was mostly retired Roman soldiers. Not many Jewish converts there. You needed 10 to have a synagogue. I got a question to ask you. Have you ever gone to water to pray? 
Have you ever gone to the Delaware over here just to say a few words of prayer? When you're at the shore, have you ever gone to the ocean amid the crashing waves to say a prayer? If you have, raise your hand. This is as old as the Bible. If there wasn't a synagogue, believers, faith people, would go to the, to the river to pray. Paul knows to go there to find people who are praying. And he finds, you know, you wouldn't make this up this way. Because at this time, women, a woman's testimony was not even accepted in the court of law at this time. So if you were making this up, you would say a group of men. You wouldn't say a group of women. And you certainly wouldn't make a big deal over a woman, which St. Paul does, Lydia. They meet a woman named Lydia. She's a dealer in purple goods. You know, when I was a kid growing up, you know, my dad worked for a company that made fans and blowers for cooling devices. They were part of NASA. And I always thought as a kid, man, you want to work for something that really makes a difference. You know, something big. But you know something? The Bible don't agree with that. Because wherever you are, God is. Purple goods. It took so many pieces of a snail to, to get purple that only rich people could afford it. And Lydia had to be well to do because she wasn't giving these rich people bargain prices. If you want purple goods, you have to pay. And they did. And so she was in a very lucrative business. And if she wasn't wealthy, she was well to do. She was packed. And also, in God's Word, there's very few places where a woman's name is mentioned directly. Lydia is a big deal. Women of the church, you are a big deal. And Luke is making sure you know that. She's a powerful woman, a worshiper of God. And listening to us, she was from the city of Thyatira. It's Asia. The spot where God told Paul not to go. He goes, doesn't go there. He goes over here and meets a lady from this place. That's the one I want you to talk to, Paul. And, I mean, this is a long journey. To speak to one person. And the Bible tells us the Lord opened her heart to listen eagerly. Oh my God. He opens her heart. What was really cool? The beginning of this passage begins with an open heart. Don't go there, don't go there. Then the dream. While well, he's, you know, he has a dream. He's sleeping. And God comes in and says, no, I want you to go here. And Paul and the other people, and there are probably other people as well besides Timothy, Silas, and Luke, they go, they have an open heart. And then the Lord opens the heart of Lydia. This is a biblical account of open hearts. Starts with open hearts, and it's very significant. Lydia has an open heart. And may God's Word be a continuing story of opening hearts, which is point three. God is still opening hearts. How is God wanting to open your heart? today. This is what God does 
with Lydia's open heart. She and her household were baptized. She's the head of her family. This is a single family home. This is, you know, a, a single, like, there's not two of them. She is the leader of her family. And they all are baptized. Help me, Lord. If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come and stay in my home. And she prevailed upon us. <coughs> There's one other place in the New Testament what we call the New Testament, where that same Greek word is used, the prevailed upon. Where do you think that might be? You remember Easter evening? They're walking out of Jerusalem when the heat is on, get out of town, and a stranger comes up to them. It's Jesus, but they don't know it. And he opens the word up to them. And they're going back to their place where they're going, seven miles from Jerusalem. And Jesus is going on further. The two disciples prevail upon Jesus. You know, Jesus must have thought in that moment, I must have done something right. Because they are showing me kindness and hospitality. They really want me to come with them. And so Jesus went with them. And he shares communion with them. And then he goes away, disappears, the Bible tells us. And that seven mile journey out of town becomes the race to get back into town to share with the other disciples, hey, Jesus is alive. The risen Christ is alive. God opens our hearts. You know, I didn't know that about the prevailed upon thing. You know, Lydia prevails upon St. Paul. But it's still the story of Jesus is risen. Jesus is alive. You know, where is the Lord prevailing upon us? Where is someone prevailing upon you just to, to be a part of things or a part of their lives? You know, God, God's Word tells us other ways that God opens our hearts. As many as we're appointed to our eternal life believe, believe, Acts 13, 48. Then to the Gentiles also God granted repentance. That leads to life. Repentance just means turning to God. God, I want you. Acts 11.10, no, 11.18. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. Acts 16.34. And then sometimes God allows our hearts to be broken in life. Sometimes when our hearts are broken, that opens us up. A broken and contrite heart. Oh God, you will not despise. That's Psalm 30, that's Psalm 51. God heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. Wounds. Psalm 147, 3. And this was always here. You know, there's a rabbinic story. Deuteronomy 6.6 6. And these words that I command you this day shall be upon your heart. A student of a rabbi asked, Why upon and not in? The rabbi said, When you have a broken heart, that's when the word goes in. That's sometimes when God really gets our attention. And you know, when God opens our hearts, here's a word from the Lord, you just never know what God is going to do. I mean, a man beckons him to Macedonia and he meets a woman named Lydia. 
Go figure. Actually, in a few verses, there will be a man, a jailer, who asks the most important question in life, what must I do to be saved? You know, I didn't have an ending for today's message, but I opened up today's our daily bread. And if you thought I wasn't paying attention, I just kept reading it over and over again. Today is our daily bread, 5-22-2022. It told a story about a lady named Amina and a guy named Joseph. They were from different places, and they were present at a demonstration, a political demonstration, on opposite sides of the political pole. Like last night, I, uh, I saw on C-SPAN, the hearings on abortion. And, oh, I want to hear just the, the different passions from, from both ends. You know, focusing on a woman's health, focusing on this is the life of a child. This is, this is a life here. But what happened, they were about to, the, the demonstration got violent. And they tried to light Joseph's shirt on fire. And Amina couldn't take it. She went over and, and, and said, knock it off. She went from the other side to the other side and said, knock it off. This, you know, don't do this. This isn't right. And the point in our daily bread, and there's, there's something deeper beyond divide. I would say beyond human sexuality, beyond, beyond anything, there's something deeper. Hold passionately to your beliefs, but God calls us to love more passionately in our beliefs. Amen. Is that an easy call? No. Is that the call? Yes. And may you help us, Jesus. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you for Acts 16, 9 through 15, and what comes before and what comes after. We thank you that you are a God who opens our hearts. Open our hearts, Lord. We ask in your name and make a way, even when there seems to be no way. It's in your name we pray. All God's people said.